on this episode of Rebel Spirit Radio. I, I align with the understanding that we're actually here to experience consciousness through the body. It has a particular frequency, a particular recipe that it works with that can't be found in the formless dimensions. Mm. So consciousness wants to experience itself through the human embodiment. And so what a, what a shame to deny consciousness knowing itself by bypassing the body and going outside of it. If it wanted to experience life in that way, then it wouldn't come into form. Mm. And so when we're talking about what does spirituality mean to me, spirituality is that, that life force energy and where that life force energy is found is in present moment. And so spirituality for me is meeting the present moment with as much of myself available so that real things can happen. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by Akashic Guide, spiritual mentor, and yoga instructor, Heather Ivany. In a wide-ranging conversation, Heather explains the Akashic Records, we discuss the nature of spirituality, learning how to communicate consciously, embedded consciousness, the importance of spiritual sovereignty, and how to manifest the change you want to see. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. Heather Ivany is a spiritual mentor, Akashic guide, and yoga teacher with over 20 years of experience leading souls through life-altering transformation and growth that aligns them to their current purpose. Harnessing a radiant warmth and decades-long immersion in spirituality, Heather's intuitive and enveloping approach awakens those who are ready to release what is limiting them and expand into higher versions of themselves. Her teachings have left an imprint on thousands of students, granting them the practical skills to unconditionally embrace the fullness of the human experience. With the gentle wisdom and compassion of one who understands the nuances of spiritual practice, she opens students to the joy of exploring the deep and mysterious inner landscape of the heart mind, and body. Heather, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Uh, Pleasure to be here with you today, Nick. Thanks for having me. Well, of course. I'm looking forward to this conversation, and I do have a couple questions for you (laughs) to start with. One, I thought that maybe you could share a bit of your background, how you came to be a spiritual mentor in the practice of yoga. You've been at this for 20 years now, and so I was wondering if maybe you could share that with the audience. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I've always had a connection to spirituality. When I was young, it was more through the form of religion. I was just raised in um, a Catholic household. The church didn't fully meet all of the sort of desires of my soul that I had. So I found I got most filled up by just being in nature. So I'd kind of jump in the car and drive the four hours to Jasper or Banff uh, for the weekend and just spend some time in the mountains and the lakes. And that was kind of where I would feel most at home. And then when I first went to university, I I traveled across the country and went to a tiny little university called St. Effects out in Nova Scotia. And it was my first time being away from home. I was having some challenges just managing all the adult, you know, things that come with leaving home for the first time. So a roommate of mine suggests that we take some meditation and yoga classes together. So that was my first kind of intro to that side of spirituality. And from there it it grew. I, I did my yoga teacher training after doing several years of really kind of extroverted masculine type work. I worked as a river guide and a forest firefighter where we would repel out of helicopters and as exciting as it was, I just really felt this pull to kind of lean more into the feminine. So I took actually a yoga teacher training, thinking that it was going to be a training just specifically in the physical postures of asana. I had no idea. I hadn't been in a yoga studio before taking the training. So I had no idea what yoga all in, in, encompassed. So 
when I was in the training, I, I soon realized that there's a meditation component, there's a philosophical component to it. And all of these little areas um, lit up inside of me and kind of brought all these different interests that I had into one home. So yoga definitely felt like a homecoming for me and that I was aligning and, and remembering an essence of myself that I hadn't quite paid attention to before. And that satiated me for a good 15 to 20 years between leading trainings and workshops and retreats and classes. I'm also a mom of, of three kids, so it, it kept me busy for sure. And then in the last like five or six years, I've just had this real tug to go deeper, not just with myself, but with clients and, and students. And I just realized that the one hour yoga class just didn't provide the space for me to be able to access that. So the Akashic Records kind of came in from the side. I wasn't looking for it. I wasn't trying to figure out how to become an Akashic Record guide. It kind of found me, if you will. <clears throat> and from there, I, I, I took the, the training just for myself and then really fell in love with it and went on to just learn how to teach others how to, how to access the Akashic Records. And that just kind of blended into the field of, of mentorship. So I really only teach classes, you know, once or twice a month just to stay connected to the community that I live in. And I offer retreats, but primarily most of my vocation right now is leaning into mentorship and, and allowing people to access the Akashic records for themselves. And also they can take sessions with me if they prefer. Yeah. Okay. All right. Can you explain a little bit about what the Akashic records are for anyone who may not be familiar with that? Yeah. So there's two sort of components that I like to lean in here in, in describing. So Akash is kind of like the bigger aperture of it. So Kasha is a Sanskrit word. It, it directly translates to uh, meaning space or spirit. So if you take the word space and apply it to sort of quantum physics. Quantum physics is the study of everything and everything is space. So it can be directly translated to quantum if you want to with the Akasha. And then spirit is, you know, a terminology that we use for consciousness, which is kind of the spiritual terminology for space. So Akasha, it's easy to apply to whatever modality you align with. If you're more spiritually based, then you can think of it as spirit. If you're more science-based, then you can think of it as the quantum. And so the Akasha is just like the bigger umbrella that uh, encompasses everything. And then someone's Akashic records or some things Akashic records is sort of like your specific uh, timeline of the, the information of your soul. So if you believe in past lives, it can go into past lives. It holds all the information in parallel universes, dimensions, other realities. It holds thoughts, beliefs, actions. So all of those imprints that are in the field kind of get housed in your own specific frequency. Think of it like a radio frequency or like a GPS signal. And that sort of divine blueprint of your, of your soul's DNA is held in what we call the Akashic Records. So some people like to think of it like an etheric book that they can that they can get access to, which is housed in the library of the Akasha. And then just to expand sort of people's thinking here, like anything that holds a purpose beyond itself has an Akashic record. Mm -hmm. So you cannot just access the Akashic records of people, but you can go into the Akashic records of a business. You can go into the Akashic records of a book. And you could go into the Akashic records of land events, animals, plants, galactic stars, and, and solar planets, lots of different ways that you can relate to it. So it's, it's very much specific and broad simultaneously. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. When we were arranging this, I noted to your, the person who was helping this, that I was pretty skeptical about the Akashic records. And the response I got was that, that you are too, but I also had said that I think that there are ways to think about it that, and I find this often with so many different things is that people will use different terms sometimes that there's a consistency to them. So I really appreciated how you kind of refer to them as consciousness and the way that I was thinking about them was, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Rupert Sheldrake. He has this idea of morphic fields that kind of encompass everything. And it's almost like a collective consciousness. 
And so I was thinking of them kind of like that, but then there also seems to be an energetic component to them as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, yeah, the, the morphogenetic field is included within your Akashic record for sure. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, it's like your imprint, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. And so how do you, how did you begin reading the Akashic records? How did that sort of happen? Yeah, it wasn't, wasn't smooth. And, and, and that's kind of just how I am as a teacher. Like when I first came into the field of yoga, yoga poses were not something that was easeful or like accessible to me in, in a lot of ways. So I had to really get into the nuances to understand the structure of the poses to be able to allow my body to be able to access them. So I don't have a flexible body by nature. So finding like little nuances and, and, and ways to allow myself to be able to access a pose rather than just like slamming into it and going, it makes the process slower, but then it makes the ability to teach it more vast because I've had to find eight different angles and how to get into, you know, like a triangle pose or something like that. So the same is true when I went into the Akashic records, it, it was almost comical for me, but like when my teacher was teaching how to work with the records, how it works or how I've learned to teach it and how I choose to teach others is I separate it into three parts and they aren't parts that are hierarchy, they're just more layers. Mm -hmm. So the first part is learning how to access your own records. The second part is learning how to access other people's records. And then the third part is just opening up the, the lens and going into, like I said, businesses, plants, animals, wherever you wanna roll with it, right? So part one, I did privately with her. And even though I had a bit of a grasp on it, I still, that, that's where my skeptic was coming in. And this is super common when, when I'm teaching people how to read the records. So let me just back up just a little bit here. So how I came into the Akashic records was when COVID hit, because I was in the field of fitness, businesses shut down. So I had a lot of time at home and then my husband's aviation. So he was also shut down. So we were just supporting each other, monitoring the kids while being in the house. So I had lots of extra time to be able to meditate and just do a lot of self-care for my own, my own body, mind, and soul. And then when I was meditating, there was this series of three nights in a row where a certain person's name just came into my mind as I was meditating and I dismissed it the first or second time. But then by the third time I was like, okay, well, so there's so long you can ignore something before it's asking you to act on it. So I knew who the woman was. She was a childhood friend of our family. And I knew that she worked with the Akashic records, but I didn't know much about the records, even though I'd been in yoga for 20 years, Akashic records wasn't something that came into my, my field very often. So I sent her an email and I just said, look, your name has come up three times in meditation. I sense that you can figure out where we need to go from here, but I'm just letting you know that this is what's happening. And so she replied back. It was really beautiful. Her reply was, thanks so much for reaching out. This is actually how I advertise. I have my guides go out and locate other people that can resonate from, from working with me and they find their own beautiful way to connect and bring you into my circle which I thought was super cool. And, uh, and then just the, the method in which she teaches, she just dismantled so many pretentiousnesses that I see in spirituality that just made it really accessible for me to work with. And then, but honestly, when we moved into, so I came out of part one, learning how to read my own records, still kind of wondering if what I'm receiving was actual or if it was just my perceived imagination of what was taking place. And then when we moved into part two, I was witnessing a lot of people being able to read other people's rec records with ease. And I wasn't having that experience. I have a very small component of me that's clairvoyant and a lot of spirituality accesses through clairvoyant, I find. Um, there's, there's a lot of meditations that will lead people into visuals. There's a lot of people when they channel or when they talk about connecting to um, other things that we can't see, it's through a visual way that they're guiding people in. And that's not how I access. So I had to kind of go to the teacher, you know, but after the program and just be like, I'm not feeling like I'm figuring out how to read other people's records. And she was very patient and super sweet and very brilliant. And she just worked with me. And what we came up with was a system of so, so my strongest clairs are claircognizance, which is your inner knowing. This is the line that comes in faster than thought. So 
when something comes into your field and says, you know, like, oh, should we, you know, hop in the car and drive to San Diego this weekend? There, there's an instantaneous yes or no that comes in with that. And then your logical reasonable, reasoning mind will come in behind it and either agree or disagree with it. So that the claircognizance is the ability to catch that, that, that message or that download before it gets overridden by the intellectual or rational mind. And then clairsentient is also what is strong for me. So that's the ability to feel and sense through the body internally and externally. So how we started to work with me reading the records is that when I would meet up with someone, I would do what I would call, we sort of figured it out together, an energetic body scan, where I would just come into the crown of their head and I would just start to slowly descend from the crown of the head downwards and just go crown of the head, the eyes, the, the face, the neck. And as I would slowly scan, then information would start to come in that I would start to share with the individual. And what was really nice about this is that it gave me a bit of a structure, gave me a bit of a system. Because what sort of my biggest fear was when I first started was uh, opening up someone's records and then them instantly bombarding me with questions and me not being able to answer them. So for the first kind of year that I did Akashic readings, I actually wouldn't give people the space to, to ask questions. They would just come on and I would say, okay, thanks for, for coming in. Here's how it's going to go. Here's my system. And what was really interesting to witness was as I would go through that energetic body scan, the majority of the questions that people would come in with would be answered just by the information that I was receiving as I was going through their body. And then to take it one step further, then, then what I was realizing was I was accessing the records through my Claire's. And then this became sort of the confidence piece for me for being able to teach others how to access the records. So anytime I have a training, what I do is prior to the training start date, those that have registered, I meet with them one-on-one -on -one and we have an Akashic reading together. And I can just do it by kind of asking, you know, is this person claircognizance? But it's not just like, are they claircognizance? Yes or no. And then moving on to the next piece. What I'm interested in is like how they receive their claircognizance. Cause even that is nuanced, even like how someone receives clairvoyance is nuanced. And so I, I identify with them what their Claire abilities are. Most people are multi clared And then we prioritize them kind of like what's the strongest. And we go down through, I only do four. I do Claire audio, Claire cognizance, Claire sentient, and hearing, seeing, and knowing. So Claire cognizance, audio, voyant, and sentient. And then of those four, we kind of put them in the order so that when we're in the training and someone's kind of hitting a wall, I just have this list of what people's clairs are and then that's how I mentor them from. So if someone's not clairvoyant, I'm not going to be asking them what they're seeing. Mm. Right. And so that's kind of, that's, that's how I access the records and this, that's how I teach others to access the records. And after doing it for several years, I still have knock on wood, hundred percent track record of everyone being able to read them by the time we finish. So it's, it's a very effective modality that I work with. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that came to mind was in I know in the traditional yogic system, especially in Pantanjali's yoga, there's this idea of the cities, and I am curious if you think that maybe your yoga practice is what led you to this, and in conjunction with that question in your trainings. Are people, is yoga part of that? Yes. Yes to both those questions. So I sort of see the, I sort of look at the unfolding of life in the way that we have an incarnated purpose, but that incarnated purpose unfolds and adapts and, and, and mal like becomes more malleable as we grow and expand ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not like someone comes in and for instance, like they're going to be a dog trainer. And so that's what they're doing for like 70 years of their life is just being a dog trainer. So when I look at the version of me in my twenties and thirties, I 100% felt that I was on purpose by teaching and leading yoga. Mm -hmm. And then the, the way that I teach yoga is I oftentimes like initially, yes, I was teaching just to the physical body. That's kind of the access point for people to feel safe and it's the most familiar like 
layer that people can align with when they first come into yoga. But then as I started teaching over the years, my practice really emerged into teaching from the space of consciousness and kind of, I was using the body as a, as a means to give people access to their own consciousness. And so that's kind of what, to answer your question, kind of merged into, well, rather than kind of going around the body to get to consciousness, is there a more direct way that I'm meant to be working with it? And the other thing that came with this, Nick, is that when I first started teaching yoga, there, there was not a yoga studio on every street corner. It was just on the cusp of that kind of blow up that happened in the mid, I don't know, what are we at, like late 90s, early 2000s. So, so then since then, being immersed in this field, like I've also seen that there's enough yoga teachers right now doing such a great job of teaching yoga that it's just giving me the, the awesome opportunity to just let that door open up for other teachers and then move into the other playing field of the deeper form of connecting with consciousness, which I mean, yes, I use the Akashic records, but I'm also noticing like as of late, I'm like, huh. I've, I've kind of found another way to cage me in. Whereas like yoga kind of caged me in with like, what about all the people that don't practice yoga right. that I could be relating with? And so I kind of, you know, grew out of the, the, the yoga title and then I moved into the Akashic records. And then right now I'm like, what about all the people that want to access consciousness, but don't necessarily feel the, the, the pull to do the Akashic record. So I'm kind of in that like transformational space right now of just being like, how can I still stay true to how I want to be relating to people, but not feel so boxed in by the Akashic record guide title that's kind of there. Right. So I'm playing with that. So to answer your question, yes, the yoga definitely led to, I can totally see the breadcrumbs that led to the Akashic records. And then there was a part two to that question. Do you remember what it was, Nick? Um, oh, if people, if yoga was part of the training, you're training people to read the Akashic records. So what I really hit home on that's really fundamental for me is that the body is this beautiful vehicle to catharticize anything that we're going through. So whenever I started training, I just, I'm sure to reiterate, like if you don't have a movement type practice, when you're going through these three months together, really important to have one, whether it's walking, CrossFit, yoga, whatever it is, the body moves energy and transforms it in a way that the mind can't. And if we aren't giving access for the body to, to sweat, to move, to stretch, to strengthen, then we just delay the, the, the the growth process, because it's kind of like moving through molasses, if you will. So I do have a component of yoga that is like, not necessarily yoga, but movement. I do have a lot of yogic terminology that will come in to help explain different things that will emerge in a yoga training, or sorry, in, a, in an Akashic training. So for example, the most recent training that I'm in, we were just talking a lot about the kosha layers, like the layers of the body and how different layers of the body will hold in different ways. So when we're talking about, let's say someone has a contract that isn't serving them in any way, shape or form, and we release that on an energetic level, awesome, excellent. But if there's not an action step that complements that on the physical plane, then quite often the energetic tendrils will, will come back in and reform that pattern that we're trying to release. So in order to explain that, I just, I talk a lot about how like there's these different kosher layers of the body and they all operate collectively, but also independently. And it's important when you're doing a reading to not just be like, oh, there we go. We cleared it. And we just kind of brush our hands and move on to the next thing. It's important to then ask the follow-up questions. Like what are the action steps that this individual can do to support the release that we've just done and keep them on the new path or the new pattern or the new version of themselves that they want to be um, spending more time with. So then we, we get information on that and we give them some, some real tangible steps that they can work with. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I like that a lot, actually. I think that there's a tendency for people to think in terms of spirituality as being untethered to the body, but the body is so crucial and so important and it holds energy. It holds trauma and it holds so much. But I also like that, you know, I've had, for example, not Akashic readings, but I've had like psychic readings and 
it's just a telling of, well, this is what I see or something without really any kind of steps forward. And it seems like that's what you're doing is you're giving people a step forward, you know, not just, well, this is what I see or here, however it comes to you, but how can you help the person manifest the change they want to see? Yeah. And to take that a step further, it's not always like, let's get rid of the goop that's showing up inside of us. It's also like, there's oftentimes where I'm like, dude, like you are tremendously connected to the light. And here's the ways in which um, the soul wants to be exploring the next becoming that you're moving into. Mm -hmm. So here's the action steps to help support that light energy. You know, it's interesting. I had someone just in the last training that I had, she came forward, beautiful, beautiful woman that wanted to be more connected to spirituality. But she's like, I don't, like when I go on retreats and I see the things that come up in retreats and and how much energy and effort with the facilitators that's taking place to, to help release and remove what's coming up. She's like, I don't, that's my hesitation. I don't actually want to work with trauma or like the major crisis healing components that I see when I'm on retreat. And so when we went into her records, I was like, cause you're not meant to, you're meant to be a way shower of the light energy. There's enough people working with the trauma and the crisis that, that you're meant to work with the people like, okay, when I've moved through a major shift or a transformation or a change, what's that for? What's the point? What are we doing this for? Like, where can I go with this? How can I experience more pleasure, more joy, more light? And I'm like, this is the arena where you come in to help show people how to, how to hold higher toleration for awe moments or spontaneous enlightenment or joy filled experiences, because there's so many people fixated on holding the tolerance for the pain that we're totally forgetting to be able to hold the tolerance for the joy. Yeah. 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 I like that. I I have a question for you. And I, I, this comes from my background in philosophy. So I'm not trying to put you on the spot here. I'm genuinely curious about your answer to this question. And I frame it in my background in philosophy because, you know, we philosophers are always like, well, what do you mean by this? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Always trying to get to the roots of things. And so I, I'm very curious, and this is something I keep thinking about and asking myself, which is the question of, well, what is spirituality? Well, great question. I'll do my best to answer in, in, in the way that, that I can. Personally, for me, where the life force energy lives, and so that's what I would call the spirit. I would call that the prana. I would call that the the aliveness in our form. The only place that that's found is in present moment, Mm. right? And so when you're, to go back to your point a few moments ago, where you're sharing, like the body isn't meant to be left behind on the spiritual journey. Like like we, we bypass it so often when we play with spirituality. To take that a little stretch further, I I align with the understanding that we're actually here to experience consciousness through the body. It has a particular frequency, a particular recipe that it works with that can't be found in the formless dimensions. Mm. So consciousness wants to experience itself through the human embodiment. And so what a what a shame to deny consciousness knowing itself by bypassing the body and going outside of it. If it wanted to experience life in that way, then it wouldn't come into form. Mm. And so when we're talking about what does spirituality mean to me, spirituality is that, that life force energy and where that life force energy is found is in present moment. And so spirituality for me is meeting the present moment with as much of myself available so that real things can happen. So yeah, (laughs) yeah. And I don't know, I'm like, I'd love to ping it back to you when you, when you philosophize on it, how does it, 
How does it feel uh, for you? It's actually fairly similar in terms of connecting to the to life energy, to life source. I often don't see it as a, I don't, I definitely don't see it kind of in religious terms where it's like God or goddess or gods or anything like that. But for me, it is that life force and there is a definite connection to nature as well. And that's, I, and it's interconnection, I think is where I see a lot of spirit. You know, one of the things there's a my favorite movie i'll share this it's the movie harold and maude and there's this scene where harold asks maude do you pray and she's like no i communicate and he says with god and she's like no with life and to me that is the core of spirituality well i love that you just shared that because that's essentially what i'm trying to distill in my own vocation is the Akashic Records is the term that I'm putting to the offering of, do you want to learn how to communicate with consciousness? Yeah. So yeah. I do it through the Akashic Records, but it, essentially that it's a, it's a, it's a training. I don't even like using the word training. Like it's a, it's a playground mm. where we get to explore how we personally communicate with consciousness and how can we amplify that and turn the volume up a little bit more. Yeah. And when you talk about, here's another big question. When you talk about consciousness, what do you mean by that? How are you thinking about consciousness the way you're using it? So I don't, because like going back to like the clairvoyant, I don't, I, I don't see it as personas. So even if I'm talking with like guides or teachers, ascended masters, ancient ones, it, for me, it's never in a persona form. It, it's it's a wave-like form, like a frequency. That's even how it comes in for me is like a feeling that there's a waveform coming in. So consciousness is the, the space where everything gets to exist. And so when you're referring to nature, what's beautiful about nature is it's always in present moment. It's never not in present mode. You know, you don't see the tree kind of going like, oh, I wish my seed was kind of planted over there where I wouldn't be canopied by this, this big other tree that's stunting my growth. Like, I mean, I, maybe they do talk like that, but I mean, it, it seems to just be this, this allowance of life pulsing through it however it wants to pulse through. And this is why it's so healing for us because it it pops us into present moment. I mean, when you get into the space of nature, it's like, you know, when you're walking down the street and having a conversation with someone, then all of a sudden you smell fresh bread from a bakery, you can be cut off mid sentence because you're like, oh my gosh. And it just brings you back to, you know, grandma cooking in the kitchen kind of thing. The same is true for nature. The moment we pop into nature, it, it has a, a scent to it that pops us into present moment. The senses pop us into present moment all the time. And then we naturally will take a deep breath, which then breath is present moment as well. So it's like layers of present moment upon itself, which just builds the deeper feeling of aliveness. So when I relate to consciousness, it's the space where I just allow everything to exist, all the polarities, all the, all the ways that the polarities come back into center. It's like inclusive of everything and exclusive of nothing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I like that as well. I tend to feel that consciousness is primary, um, that it's foundational. Sometimes I will phrase it as that I think consciousness is the medium for being. Um, it is the experience, the awareness of being, of beingness. And I find it interesting to go back to yoga for a moment is that a lot of people don't necessarily understand that yoga is not just about getting bendy, but at the heart of yoga philosophy is this movement towards greater consciousness. Mm. And a lot of the movement is preparing you to be able to sit in a seat of yeah. that consciousness, right? Yeah. 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 And, that, and that's what I would tell students sometimes is that one of the main points of yoga is so that you can actually be comfortable sitting in meditation. 
Mm. for long periods of time. Yeah, yeah. And then just how beautiful I love that contrast to be because oftentimes we, we, as we start to journey into the, you know, when I was talking about the pretentiousness of spirituality, then we start to put a hierarchy over stillness versus movement. Mm -hmm. And we forget that before we're, before we're able to be still, we have to be able to move and the movement leads to stillness. And so the same way that the quiet spaces aren't better than the loud spaces, both are, are, are needed. And, and part of what I like to play with is like, the, the people that I see that are, you know, awakened or on the path of, of awakening, oftentimes they're the ones that can really beautifully hold the paradox between the contrast and just sit in the space in between and have an equal reverence for both. And so rather than thinking of it as like climatizing yourself to going higher and higher and higher in order to be awakened, it's, it's, it's like... How do we, and it's like holding the middle ground, but not being unopinionated or, or, or like pushed over that, like you, like I still have integrity, you know, th these individuals still have a strong level of integrity and morality, but they know when to speak and when to just hold the space. Yeah. 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 Well, without morality, I don't think there is awakening. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. 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 And that's part of the yoga system too. <laughs> There's a deep moral aspect to it. And you also see that in Buddhism as well. So I'm curious, you know, people will come to you for these readings and it seems like so many of us, the problem is that the life force is kind of blocked that I think often people don't feel present to their own lives. Mm. And what would be the first step for someone to start feeling that aliveness again? It depends on the degree of what you're referring to as being blocked. I think that there's different, different degrees of that. So if someone is, I'll say like the most extreme of like, just like constantly pinging from compulsion to compulsion to compulsion, where I like to start is choosing an activity that you, and usually those that are quite compulsive driven, that there is a movement that they're doing as well because they can't sit still. So then I'll tap into, you know, what is it that you, that you do for, for movement practice? And if it's someone that's like, oh, I go for like a five kilometer walk every day with my dog, then what I'm starting to work with them with is, can you start to move from the head into the body by simply allowing the senses to be a part of your walk? Mm -hmm. So as you're moving along, what's the furthest sound that you can hear in the distance? And what is it? Can you identify it? Is there more than one? And then what's the closest sound that you can hear? Is it, you know, the sound of your own breathing, or even if you're working hard, can you almost like hear the sound of your heartbeat in a sense? And then we just play with that with all the senses. And so it gives them something that's tangible that they're aware of. It's not taking them into the, the philosophy so far that they have to start with something brand new. Right. Everyone knows what the senses are. And <clears throat> they're just like this lovely gateway of, of being able to access present moment. And so people that are trying to work with just the capacity to be present, I'll usually start with their senses. I don't actually start with a meditative practice at all. It's just, it's just what are you doing in your daily life that you can just easily weave this into? And that might even stem into like, if they have no movement practice, it's like, okay, let's look at how you eat a meal. Are you eating a meal, listening to a podcast while also, you know, taking notes or, or planning your agenda for the rest of the day kind of thing? So then I'll invite them into just like as much as they can to clear out the peripheral distraction and to consciously taste the food that they're eating, to smell it, to look at it. Do they even like the look of the meal that they're about to have? Does it have like an aesthetic appeal to yeah. it? And then from there, like, does it smell good? And then the taste to it. And even that alone can be transformational for a lot of people. They're like, I actually eat a lot of food that I don't like and it's bland and, and uninvitational. So that, that, that starts to create the shift there. Yeah. And then if someone's like more moving into, you know, kind of, kind of not 
that distracted. What I'll usually try and, and play with is <clears throat> just this conversation of distraction. Just how I have this sort of like con like idea or, or like thought that the center of ourselves is one of the most powerful places that we can reside in. And there's many influences in life that will work very hard to ensure that you don't hang out with your center. And so those that are at the point where they're aware of their center, but they just keep getting distracted by the periphery, that's where I'll start to, to work with them is notice the moments in the day when you get pulled out of your center and into the periphery and how can you bring yourself back? So for some individuals, it's simply boundary work, like being able to say no, being able to hush the inner critic and let the, the light in them actually speak to them for a moment. Sometimes it's, it's working with an actual mindful meditation practice that can show them how to redirect back to the center line. Sometimes I always start when I work with people, the, the number one place where we start with is um, identifying what it is that you want. Mm. And, and how I work with that is, is if you're going to conceptualize that from the mind space, then let's do an exercise together where we get to take that desire and we get to, to feed it into the heart space and see if the heart and the soul are in agreement with the desire. And we can also work it in reverse. We can go really, really quiet and, and let the subtle space kind of consume us and then pitch the question from the subtle space. Like, what is it that I'm desiring? And then when we come out of that subtle space, then we can just check in with the cognitive brain to see if it's capable of getting on board with it. And what I find for most people, I, I mean, this is getting back to the yoga. I, I then will bring it into the form of Sankalpa right? And if people aren't um, interested in Sankalpa, then I'll work with intention. But the, to me, they're different, but to the outsider, it can seem like it's the same thing. So I just let it be what it is. But that Sankalpa, that, that desire, that intention, it becomes your anchor. Mm. So then whenever you notice yourself in distraction, you get to just ask the question, is this leading me further away from my Sankalpa or closer towards and then this just gives you a really good barometer on how to start to notice what it is that you're tolerating that maybe you don't need to, the areas in your life that are requiring more discipline, more habit that, that serves your Sankalpa. And this just gives a really beautiful playing ground to work with. And then the person that's well on the path, they're probably like a way shower and energetic uh, support person in some way, shape or form. With those individuals, I'm working more with, okay, how can we expand your light energy? How can we allow ourselves permission to take up more space? Hmm. It's a long answer, but I just no. wanted to go into the different layers of it. Yeah, no, 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 that's perfect. Thank you for that. Because, you know, the questions that I'm thinking about are, in general, the world that we live in it sometimes seems as if the world that we live in is contrary to living from our own inner essence, our own core and what we truly want. And it seems like it takes an act of courage to do so because sometimes it also feels that fear will hold people back. And I'm curious if that is mirrored in your experiences and if so, how, how can we live more, more authentically? And this is getting to another question that I have for you because I noticed on some of your programs and you mentioned this a couple of times that you have a program on sovereign leadership, but you also discuss spiritually sovereign. And it seems to me that maybe that's the answer to my question, <laughs> that there's this sovereignty uh, involved. So am I on the right track? So reframe your question for me one more time, if you don't mind. Oh, I will try my best. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was thinking in terms of just being in the world. Yeah. And it, being in the world is difficult. And there are all these forces that are always... Um, surrounding us. You know, we have to pay our bills. We have to deal with other people. We sometimes have jobs that we don't particularly care for. And I think that 
sometimes it seems as if there is a friction between what we're doing and what our spirit tells us we should be doing and getting from point A to point B often it seems as if there is a good chunk of fear. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so then does that feel complete? Can I respond? Yes. Okay. So the fear component, as I understand it, is the unknown. And, and this is, I'm going to lay just like a little foundation here just for the listeners. And then, and then I'll go into more of, of my response to your question. So uh, we're aware of like the, the ego component of ourselves and we're aware of the, the higher self component of ourselves. So the ego is connected to our resistance and it's connected to our subconscious mind. It's designed to keep us safe. And how it keeps us safe is by keeping us in what we know. What we know is what we're taught by those around us, how, we, how our upbringing and all the rest of it. And then the moment that we start to access our higher self, which essentially how I define that is the version of you that is not incarnated. So the, the, the thread, if you think of your soul as like a sun, the center of the sun, there's many different rays that comes off the sun. One of your rays is in this incarnated form. And there's another component of, of a ray that is in the dimensional form. So when we're relating to our higher self, it's the version of us that is not incarnated and therefore it has a point of view that's different than what we have on earth here. So when the higher self comes in and says, hey, let's start taking a look at this or, or seeing how we can expand in this way, the ego comes in because it's like, whoa, dude, we're going into the unknown. I'm not super comfortable there. I know how to get your attention by not listening to the higher self. The easiest way for me to shut you down is to put you in a state of fear. Those make sense. For others, it's addiction. For others, it's all kinds of ways that we play with it. So these two components of ourselves, I call them sort of the becoming, which is the higher self. And then the part of us that wants to stay the same, it's another version of your being, not the being in like the divine essence that just wants to be in its wholeness, but the being in the part of the, ourselves that just wants to stay the same. Okay. And so these two parts of ourselves, they don't really go together. We can try, but it's really hard to make them get along. So we have, when you're referring back to sovereignty, sovereignty to me is choice. So we have choice in every moment of every day to choose to listen to the part of ourselves that wants to grow and expand, or we can choose to listen to the part of ourselves that doesn't. Really important to appreciate that both choices are valid. Okay. So, so, so the, the resistant part of ourselves still might be serving a very protective, high functioning component in our, in our self and keeping us very safe. And it also might be just operating out of an old pattern that doesn't work anymore. And it's just doing that because that's how it knows what to do. The body will always take the path of least resistance. So then in that sovereignty, it's, it's choosing what we want to um, have in that moment. And so a lot of the spiritual practice for a lot of people is burning the belief systems that keep us in a state of unworthiness and deny us access to our wholeness. And that can be an entire life journey of spirituality, simply burning away the belief systems that, that don't serve us, whether they, they don't serve us because they are um, based on pride or ignorance or laziness. There's lots of reasons why our belief systems will be there. But the truth sets, like what is true for us, sets us free by destroying the parts of ourselves, by burning in the fire, the parts of ourselves that are not serving. Okay. So then based on this, if I'm understanding your question, it's, it's, is, is the question more like, there's a lot of contradiction between like, this is what er the earthly experience provides for us is the stress and worry of paying the bills, trying to figure out how to do life getting caught up in things that aren't really fulfilling, whether it's, you know, zoning out on Netflix or, or getting high all the time. And then there's this other component of the spiritual aspect. And like, how do we bridge the gap between the two? Is that sort of what the question was? Yeah. 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 How, how do you be, how, how do you honor that life force and spirit in a world that doesn't seem to want to honor it? Okay, so let me just like play like this is my own little Heather musing that's coming in here a little bit. Yeah. Something that I'm playing with recently is 
take 10 years ago, how easy it was for us to, so part of me believes that how our systems work and take it or leave it people, but how our systems work is, is ensuring that we don't pay attention to our sovereignty because our sovereignty is more powerful than the system itself. So there's a lot of ways in which our school systems, our medical systems, our political systems are designed to keep us away from our center because there, there's a, a huge power that comes from empowerment, okay? So then take a decade ago of this, this like 80 years of building all these systems up to get us to the point where it's like, wow, it's actually working really well. People are consistently popping out of their center and being um, pulled into whatever's flashy in that moment. And then what I'm finding really interesting is that it's actually starting to have the reverse effect where the, the band-aids are being ripped off left, right, and center. So the exposure of what the systems are being seen for what they are. And now people are in this position of like, okay, I can't go political because the left has left me, the right has left me. So, so political doesn't work. Like I can't go there. I can't go into that distraction because the distraction actually doesn't align with me anymore. And then I can't go into pharmaceutical, like all the things, right? So every way that we're used to popping out is having the Band-Aid ripped off, being exposed in such a way that we don't want to hang out in that field anymore. So what's the reverse of that? We're being pulled back into our center. Now, from the outsider looking in, it just looks like a lot of chaos. It's like, oh my God, every single system in the world seems to be going through its own chaos right now. But how I like to look at it is like, nobody's being left behind mm. with a place that they can hide in. Mm. So everyone is being invited to take a good look at what is true for them because there's nowhere that you, like almost every system is being exposed. So there's nowhere that you can hide anymore. And so that can be really uncomfortable and painful. And obviously, as we can see, it's creating a lot of chaos and, and destruction and the only place to find a semblance of peace or safety or a home is in the midline. And yet for so many people, this creates a lot of fear because the midline is unknown to them because they've been in the periphery for so long. So for some, it's like, mm, they're nestling in and having a nice cup of cocoa and like going to the inner. And for others, it's like, they're, they're still trying to ping, but they can't ping anywhere. So they're in this place of like, I can't go in and I can't go out. And so it's creating a lot of agitation in the system. Yeah. And yet, when we talk about like, like being messy, how I understand like the mess, like, like my own mess when I'm in it, it's like the system that I'm, the, the way that my body constructs itself, the way it builds itself up is no longer serving. So it's like, the scaffolding is falling down and the new system, my nervous system hasn't calibrated to it. So the messy is oftentimes regarded as like something we don't want to look at, but it's actually this, to me, this really beautiful poignant place where it's like, oh my God, you're, you're in the mess, which means that the new scaffolding is building itself right now. Just, just hang out in the mess if you can because because what wants to be seen and what wants to be birthed from this it's it's right on the horizon line yeah yeah it's you're hitting on themes that keep coming up in discussions that i have and one of the main themes is that we are undergoing a process of initiation and like you just said you know something new is being reborn and when you talk about, you know, the messiness, that's chaos, but I always like to think of chaos as like pure potentiality. Yeah. There's a lot of potential here. And the other theme, and I think this is consistent with what you're saying and teaching is, and this also keeps coming up over and over and over again, is that we have to remember who we are. And the way I'm thinking about this in terms of what we've been talking about is that 
in this world that we live in, we seem to have cut ourselves off from ourselves. And a remembering of who we are is literally a remembering, kind of becoming whole again in a way. But that is a painful, messy process. It can be if we have a belief system that aligns with it having to be that way. Yeah. And so, you know, there uh, several years ago, I was in the process of going through a separation with, with my husband and the business that I was involved in rejected me. So I was, I was out there and there was all of these different places where I couldn't go and hang out in to avoid what was actually happening. And so the only place that I could go into was me. And I could only use myself as my source of guidance as to what my next step would be. And, and in that process, I was learning how to be comfortable with the uncomfortableness of that. And that was my constant daily mantra for myself. How can I be comfortable in the uncomfortableness? Because the void ended up being much longer than I expected it to be. There was no decision. Like I was in a non-decision. I couldn't make a decision with work. We weren't making a decision with our marriage. My kids were good and didn't need, need me. So I couldn't just like immerse myself into like being the really good mom and doing bake sales. So like it was this time when I just had to like sit in the void of the uncomfortableness of not knowing what decision to make next. And it lasted 12 months longer than I thought it was going to last. I thought it'd be like a six month sit. And it was like an 18 months sit that I sent, ended up being in. But if there was a part of me that had a belief system that, I mean, I'd say time is our biggest destroyer of potential moments. Like, so if I had the expectation of like, oh, it's been seven months, therefore a decision needs to be made. And I would have made a decision, not allowing the decision to reveal itself to me. Then I would have disrupted the transformation that wanted to take, t- take place in that moment. If I moved into addiction because I didn't like the uncomfortableness of what was taking place and just started to have a bottle of wine every night or something like that, it just takes me out of the the sacredness of the moment that I was in. And so, yes, I was able to be there and sit there and be in that space, but it's because there's just this foundation of years of experience of, of playing with the inner that allowed me to make peace with it. So I have so much compassion for the people that I see and myself included that are find it so hard to be in the midline because they've just been taught for so long how to, how to reject it because it rejects you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is tricky. It's tricky work and it's, it's a process, I think. And it's an ongoing process. I was wondering if maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the programs that you offer. I know that I had mentioned there were three of them, the Unlocking You, Sovereign Leadership, and Inwards, which is a meditation practice, I think. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can kind of go through them one by one a little bit just to see what they are for anyone who may be interested. So the Unlocking You just the title seems to be consistent with what we've been talking about, which is sort of finding that center and being present to one's own life. Yeah. Really sweet that you're, that you're willing to to spend some time going through this um, with your listeners. So all of the offerings that I have are actually, they're created from Akashic sessions that I've had with people. So uh, oftentimes I find that people that come in for an Akashic reading, there's one of two ways that, that I'm playing with them. One is when the reading's done, so when I do Akashic sessions, the, the niche that I sort of have is that I work with the present moment and I support people in really understanding their incarnated purpose in this moment in time, because as I said, it's malleable, mm-hmm. and either aligning with it if they are foreign to it or expanding it. So this is where the unlocking you goes in one direction and the sovereign leadership goes in the other direction. So when I would see people that would come to an Akashic session, they're like, okay, great. I've just had this wonderful session with you. 
I want to be more in the company of my soul and I have no idea where to go next. So unlocking you is based off of like the 20 years of yoga training and, and experience as a practitioner that I have, that I've just curated a program to help the individual unlock themselves. So similar to some components that we talked about earlier, we start with the foundation of what is it that you want? What is it that you desire? Because for most people, they don't even know how to, how to dream anymore or imagine anymore because they're just so used to not getting what they want that they don't even want to go through the pain of allowing themselves the opportunity to even imagine what it is that could be possible. So we start with that foundation. From there, we build into once you know what you want, then resistance is going to come in. So how do we make resistance our ally rather than our enemy? We work with boundaries because it's essential. Like you said, morality is really important to our awakening. Morality and boundaries, I feel, go hand in hand. Then we also play with meditation. So designing uh, a meditation practice that actually supports the person. So a lot of that leans into their clairs. A lot of people are like, oh my God, I do mantra when I meditate, but I don't find it works. Well, if you're not claircognizant, then repeating a mantra in the mind space isn't going to work for you. If you're clairsentient, you need to do a, a meditation that actually gets you into the body. So we, we work with like how to create a meditation practice that actually supports and, and like encourages the mastery that you have rather than trying to assume that you have to have a new skill set. And then we finish with rest because fundamentally rest for me is one of the most profound spaces that are just so it's highly like suggested <laughs> and rarely implemented. Right. right. So, so we get back to yoga nidra, we get back into the qualities of rest and why it's important. So that's the unlocking you taking someone from the distraction of the periphery and helping them get in contact with their center in a very peaceful, self-loving, self-compassionate way. And then the other side that I see that when people come into Akashic sessions is they have this like purpose and, and dream and, and life that they want to be having, but they, they can't figure out how to unlock their, their energetic entrepreneur that's within them. So sovereign leadership is a program that's designed to really allow people who, who want to be sovereign. So to, they want to be having choice in how they operate their lives and then finding ways to work with their mastery and their superpower of energetic work into being an entrepreneur. So how can you, just how I mentioned, like this teacher was like, oh, that's how I advertise. My guides talk to your guides. How do you actually do that? How do you call people in to your services from the field rather than using a Google marketing system? You can use both. I'm not dismissing the Google marketing, but let's use the qualities of you that are awesome. We also go into talking about power because as you hold higher states of light, you have to create a deeper relationship with power. And people that are in like a dysfunctional relationship with power, as soon as it comes in, they throw it away. Mm. So how do we calibrate to hold a deeper relationship with power so that when deeper forms of our business come in and ourself come in, we can actually sustain it and tolerate it. We go into money. We look at people's money stories. How can you have a conversation with someone about what you're charging, how you can hold space for someone while they're having the waffling decision of buying or not buying? how to clean up your own money story. Cause you can't just, Oh, I'm worth it. So I'll charge it. Like ask anyone who's tried that and does it actually work? Like you can't just charge it and expect people to just be like, Oh, perfect. That's what they're charging. Now I'm going to pay it. Like oftentimes there's a conversation we have to have with people there. So sovereign leadership is all about like how to look at the consciousness of your business as its own separate entity, its own personality. There's an Akashic record for your business just because it's created by you doesn't mean it's 100% your personality. It has its own personality. So we get to know it in the sovereign leadership. So it's, it's building and expanding your business from a spiritual perspective, not just a, like a marketing analytical yeah. perspective. Yeah. And then the, the, the Akashic training, this is just my own heart mission of relating back to the pretentiousness of spirituality and just how we oftentimes will look at people at like, oh, well, Nick's really good at this and, and Nick's born with this innate talent and therefore Nick can do this thing. And, and I just like to dismantle that pretentiousness with spirituality. So if someone comes into an Akashic reading and they really have a desire to learn how to read the Akashic records, that's what the training's for. Anyone that has that heart desire, I can, I can work with them. If they've gotten to the point where they've been able to find me out of the 7 billion people in the world, then I trust hundred percent that we're meant to work together and that I can help them access um, their ability to be able to communicate with consciousness. 
Yeah. And then the inward series, that's simply for those that, that want to be in a deeper relationship with meditation. And so I have several recording of meditations on there, but then I also have several videos where I just talk about the, the demystifying of meditation and how to make it something that's more accessible. Like simple things like, you know, the, the mind is meant to file and sort. So the, the quieting of the mind is not the end game of meditation. It gets to just do what it does. And, and we sit in the space of returning back to present moment when that distraction comes in. So little things like that to demystify meditation. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for going over mm -hmm. this. I, I do have a few more questions for you. Yeah, let's do uh, it. <laughs> well, one is that we're going to kind of go backwards a little bit, I think, but you've mentioned a couple times mm -hmm. this pretentiousness of spirituality. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you mean by that. Well, I think where it first came up with me was seeing the pretentiousness in religion mm -hmm. and how we're taught, you know, I just really saw that growing up, just how we're, we, I was encouraged to outsource my relationship to God to another, rather than letting it being something that I can be empowered to resource myself. And so I think initially, you know, in my late teens, when I moved into the, the field of spirituality, I saw it as this really freeing opportunity to be in conversations with God, consciousness, source, energy, whatever word you want to put in there, in a way that didn't ask me to outsource. And then the longer that I resonated in that field, I could see the same things that showed up in religion just being handed over to spirituality. So just something as simple as like, when someone is clairvoyant, we assume in society that that is an inborn talent that someone has and not a skill set that anyone's curated. Now you take that into any other arena in life and we appreciate that you actually have to work for it. You can't be a sprinter without training for it. You can't be a really good medical doctor or naturopath without actually doing years of training to get to that point. And yet when you lean into the realm of spirituality, it's like, ah, oh, you're born with it or you're not. All right. And so that's part of what I love to demystify is like it, everyone, just how we all have the chakras and, and these are energy centers within us. The, the clear abilities are exactly the same and you can either massage them and help them to percolate and be more of a guidance system in your life, or you can ignore it. And so that's kind of the places where I like to play with is like, where do we just kind of get pretentious with spirituality? Like mm. that person over there gets to have it, but I don't. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I like that. And yeah, I'm going to be speaking with someone in a few weeks who's written books about how to develop uh, a lot of these skills. And I think that's a really important point that people don't often think about is that some of these things can't be developed you know, that we can work at them, but you have to put in the work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and you have to be willing to suspend the part of you that wants to sit in doubt, mm -hmm. fear, unworthiness, as you start to curate it. This is, this is a lot of the container holding that I'm doing in the Akashic training mm -hmm. is, yeah, at the, at the very beginning, all of the stuff, all of those fears, doubt, worries, just put them on me. I gotcha. Yeah. I'll, I'll hold the confidence for you that you can actually read the records. And then as the training goes on, I'm just slowly like giving it back to them and being like, you still want to hold this or do you want to let it go? And it's, it's fascinating to watch how much of the training is people managing the, the different parts of themselves and, and seeing which one wants to be in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to let the the higher voice of wisdom, my kingly or queenly version of me rides shotgun. Mm. And then the, the resistant kind of inner child that wants to pretend like I can't do this. Can they just sit in the back seat, play with their Legos for a bit? Mm. Cause that individual has just ridden shotgun with me for so long. I'm just tired of having you next to me. I want someone else sitting next to me. So that's a lot of what we're managing when we're, when we're learning how to read the records. And then what's beautiful is then that gets to just spill into the everyday life. You can take that into any arena afterwards and, and see how it shows up and where it wants to grip. Yeah. So yeah. every, everyone has the ability. They just need to work the muscles. 
Totally. Yeah. And for some people, the muscles are actually, this is the coolest part, Nick, is that the muscle is actually already working. We just don't see it as working because we're not seeing it in its sacredness. Mm. So for example, like, okay, so for me, someone's clairvoyance will like, there's the, all the inner eye of like seeing auric fields and visions and dream space and all that stuff with clairvoyance. But how I see clairvoyance showing up very strongly in the external, like physical eye is the ability for someone to walk into a room and see so much more of what's going on than the average person. Mm. They can tell if, if the space, if people are connected or not connected, they can get information. Like there's just so many things that they can see when they walk into a room, they'll notice like the tapestry in the back corner, like even things that feel superficial, it all feeds into the landscape of what it is that they're reading with their clairvoyance. Mm. And so like even individuals that I would say, like they would almost view themselves as superficial because they pay attention to like what I was talking about at the beginning, like when I make a meal, I like to aesthetically arrange my plate so that I, I'm, I'm creating an experience that's alive and welcoming me into the meal that I'm about to have. When that individual gets dressed in the morning, they're paying attention to the colors that they're wearing and the impact it'll have and how it represents the mood that they're having. When they go into a space, they're noticing the layout of the room and how it creates sort of a feng shui atmosphere versus like a cacophony kind of atmosphere. Now to the, to the superficial eye, this feels unnecessary and unimportant. So someone can suppress this part of themselves thinking that it's insignificant and not important. When, in, when we go in and we discover that they're clairvoyant, it's like this outer eye that you see life through feeds the inner clairvoyance and allows you to communicate with consciousness. So we want to vivify this. We want to pull it out. We want it to be more revered and respected within you so that you can create a deeper connection to consciousness. Mm. And then, and so then to them, like, that's not, I don't think anyone's described clairvoyant in that way, or, or right. you know, I'm sure someone has, but it's not the common way of describing it. You can do the same with claircognizance. Oftentimes someone who's a high intellect, this is what I'm seeing a lot, which is like, this is where I'm seeing the evolution of claircognizance. Cause I also see that the clairs are actually evolving as we're evolving. Mm. So in the past, claircognizance was separate from the intellectual mind. So like the claircognizance would come in, the intellectual mind would either agree with it or poo poo it, right? Now what I'm starting to see is that the advancement of claircognizance is actually this, this intertwining of the two where the lines between them start to get blurred. So someone might be, this is where people can also get tripped up reading the records where they're like, I can't actually tell if I'm reading the records because how the information is coming in is also mixing with this huge knowledge base that I have on this subject. And it's, it's interrupting the claircognizance. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Your intellect is intertwining with the claircognizance that's coming through to create a very clear message of information to yourself or to the person that you're working with. And so oftentimes a lot of intellects get so pushed out of the spiritual realm because we revere wisdom more than we do knowledge in the spiritual community. And so what I love is like the evolution of claircognizance. It's blending the intellect, the knowledge mind with the wisdom mind, and it's creating an amplified experience of claircognizance. Mm. So not only like, yes, everyone has these qualities, but we don't even see the superpowers that we have because we're so used to viewing them in this one lens that society tells us makes us clairvoyant, claircognizant, clairsentient. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. And well, our society also likes to say that these things just don't exist and that they're impossible, but yet there is a lot of evidence, you know, there's a lot of evidence for their existence. And as you were speaking, the thing that came to mind was, um, just different ways of knowing. And I think that's important. And maybe that's part of this transformation that we're undergoing because we have really privileged one way of knowing above all others. And it also reminds me of, and I think this is a little bit different, but contemplative education, which I think is that merging of the wisdom and the intellect. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and how that's becoming more prevalent and more accessible and more, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. There was a point where, what did you say at the very beginning when you, when you just responded to what I shared? That a lot of people, we, our, our society kind of rejects these kinds of knowledges. Oh, right. Um, yeah. So, so the, the thing that I find fascinating, my, my mind doesn't work like I can, I can understand the science, but then I can't teach from the science, if that makes right, sense. Right, my, my intellect right. isn't strong enough to teach from the science. So what I find more fascinating is like, okay, I can explain the Akashic records in the form of like this etheric library where like information goes up, it's stored. And then when you want to recall it, you can pull it back down. Mm. Okay. That to me makes sense because there's, there's no yeah. like physical things that are pulling those levers, right. but then to live in a time where we have something like the cloud, mm. where someone has actually created a system in physical form where you can take information from your computer, you can send it up to be stored in this cloud mm. that then can be pulled down as information that at a later time when you need it. This is your own personal library, right? Your documents and all the rest of it. The fact that we've designed a physical system to represent this conscious realm that for me is more mind blowing than trying to get on board with like, does it exist or does it not exist? Right, right, right. It, it blow. And, and even the way that quantum physics can like, I mean, there's a, there's a machine that can actually give a, a measurement of your auric field. Mm. And you can see that on a screen like that blows my mind. Yeah. There's even like, I forget, there, there's a couple of gentlemen that I listened to once that they could, they can go into Oh, what is it called? But they they go into like a space, like any any space, like like a like a church in in Europe, and they can go in and they can measure the consciousness level of a building, of a space, mm. of an event, with like some sort of a, a a thing, a machine that they have. So, although I respect the conversation on like you know so many people don't believe it, it's like but there's so much evidence that exists in the physical form to support it. The cloud is a physical representation of the Akashic field, mm -hmm. right? And then if you look at like the, the movies and stuff that are coming out now, like I just watched on the weekend, everything, everywhere, all at once. Oh yeah. I love that movie. Oh my gosh. And like, so as I'm watching it, I'm like, like dimensions and stuff, I, I, I get them to a certain extent, but then I don't. Right. And so the fact that someone can actually like write, direct, and create a movie that makes sense, but doesn't make sense at the same time. Like, I find that fascinating that the yeah. human mind can do that. So I sit more in the field of the, of the like awe and admiration for like, mm. how do people take consciousness and put it in physical form? Cause yeah. the, the reverse is way easier for me to get on board with. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was talking about like proof, kind of the place I was coming from is the, major paradigm that we exist within is one of materialism and materialism has a very difficult time answering the question of consciousness. And I think that that question is what is really driving the change into an entirely new way of being an entirely new paradigm uh, in worldview. Can you expand on that a bit? answering the question of consciousness well yeah i mean this is just philosophically speaking yeah go There's for it a question of and this goes back a long ways but it's the beginning of modern philosophy with uh, Rene descartes i think therefore i am and it is that mind consciousness has totally different qualities than the body and so you have this question of, well, what is consciousness? And for Descartes, you know, consciousness was equal to the soul in many ways. And so you have scientists now that are like, yep, we're just matter, you know, conscious. Some will even say that consciousness is an illusion. And I, that just boggles my mind because I'm like, well, but if it's an illusion, there has to be the experience of the illusion and that requires consciousness. Yeah. <laughs> and so in philosophy and in science, consciousness is the big question. And this materialistic view can't answer it. And so 
now you're starting to hear people talk about, well, consciousness is the foundation of all things. It's not matter, it's consciousness. And one of the things that came to mind when you were talking about the cloud and how the cloud is sort of this metaphor for reading the Akashic Records, there was a theologian, Tehar de Chardin, who talked a lot about this evolution of consciousness. And he suggested that uh, what he called it was the newosphere, is that at one point there would be like a collective consciousness around the earth. That yeah. That's where we were heading. So then I'm sure this is something that, that you've already ruminated on, but just bringing it to light here a little bit, the, the conversation that we're having, there's a point where the intellectual mind can't go with it. Right. It has a, it has a cap. It has a limiting point that it has. And this is why a lot of philosophical or religious texts can only relate the concept in the form of like a symbolic story of some sort, because the, the conceptual mind can't get on board with it. So in the sense that like, you know, one of my teachers, Ali Bogard, she talks about how the, there, there's a nature within us that knows. Mm -hmm. And so like when a mother gives birth and holds that baby, on a human level, she, you have no frigging clue what to do. There's no instruction book. There's no nothing. Like, how do, how do I, how do I, how do I soothe, feed, do all the things? And yet, when we go beyond the conceptual mind and into our nature that knows, because it's a part of this web of consciousness that repeats itself over and over and over again, there's a part of her nature that knows how to breastfeed. There's a part of her nature that knows how to soothe. And yet the only way that we can explain that is by giving the description of what I just shared with like the mother and a baby. But if we just talk about it in a, an open concept of like, there's just a, a consciousness that knows itself, it makes no sense. Hmm. So it has to be brought into some sort of a symbolic right, experience right, right. for us to be able to make sense of it. So the field of the material has an edge point. Hmm. And if, if that for anyone is the highest, not highest as in better than, but is as in the most elevated form, and then that's it, there's nothing else beyond it. And that's as far as they can go. So you're a scientist that can't get on board with consciousness and think it's an illusion because they have a a cap that the intellect right. is the, the place where it ends. And then the consciousness is in the space beyond it. And so it's, it's everyone's game as to whether or not you want to get in with that game or not get in with that game. Yeah. 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 I, I just find it endlessly fascinating. Totally. I think that, I think we are in this transformative period. And I agree with you that we need the metaphors and the symbols to, to adequately try to speak of these things. Because the concepts, if we were just to talk about concepts, every one of my listeners would just tune out yeah. <laughs> because they're kind of dead and dry. Yeah. So, um, so but well, I think, the metaphor puts the life force energy into it too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And, you know, that's where, it, and that's the other way that I have thought about the Akashic Records. And I'm making a leap here from metaphor because what came to mind was myth. And then I immediately went into collective unconscious um, and that all of these things are available and primal and instinctual and always there, but we often don't listen, but they're there to guide us. Yeah. And there's so much that we listen to. That's the other part that I find, like even most recently, I was having this inner sort of conundrum with myself where like I work with the Akashic records, but I work with them in a very practical way. Mm -hmm. And so I was having a conversation with someone a few weeks ago where they really wanted to have kind of a galactic conversation about like the Akashic records of different planets and star systems. And I know maybe one or two, and then I kind of don't know much else beyond that. 
And so the so when I went away from the conversation, this is just interesting about like the human experience and like knowing your lane and staying in it. I think you mentioned something about that earlier, mm -hmm. but there was a part of me that was then pulled to the periphery. And I was like, you know, if I really want to be, you know, an authority in not that right word, but like, like a masterful in the Akashic records, I really need to like learn the galactic components of the Akashic records. And so here I am on this walk in the forest, like having this inner conversation of like, yeah, this is what I need to do. And then I stopped myself and I was like, this is someone's opinion that I'm now adopting as my truth. When really, if I get quiet, it doesn't interest me very much. Right. I can have a conversation on the aliens and, the, and all the things, but it's not a place that I want to take a deep dive into. And where I really like to play is in the field of consciousness. And if I pair that down a little bit more is just, I like, I love how you want to get really specific with meanings of words. Mm -hmm. And what I'm playing with is just love. Like, like yeah. how can I, I, how can I know the myriad of ways to know love, right? Mm -hmm. And so I get more pulled with the Akashic records. I sometimes sit with ascended masters like Mother Mary, and I just have her teach me and other different fields like that. And so it just, in that moment, I just had this like epiphany of just like, oh my gosh, I just watched myself go on this total line of energy of feeling like I wasn't good enough and I need to adopt this and I need to learn this all because this was pulled from a conversation. Mm. Now, that's a conversation. So if you add in like the number of things that we tune into to read, listen, watch on a daily basis that constantly is fascinating and interesting, but not really putting us in any direction. We're just like, we're at like a stop sign with like multiple different ways to turn, but not actually turning. Mm. Right. And so th th then for me, it was just like, okay, like come back into your center, come back into your home. This is how I relate to the Akashic records. I love to teach people how to get to know themselves in such a beautiful way and have a deeper relationship with consciousness. Mm -hmm. And for now, there's no other breadcrumbs that are showing me to, to go in a different way because this is still the direction I'm meant to be playing with. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, I forget what I was responding to that you mentioned, but it just, just staying in your lane is just such an important component to this whole journey. Sure. Sure. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Well, I, I know that we are, uh, we've been talking for a while now mm -hmm. and I so appreciate your time and I appreciate the conversation too. Like I said, at the very beginning, you know, I was a little skeptical of Akashic records, but I have thoroughly enjoyed learning about them from you and you've opened possibilities uh, in my thinking, I think, which I appreciate. Before we wrap up here, let me ask you, what do you have coming up? Yeah, I have always Akashic trainings that happen throughout the year. So there will be one posted in May and, and then even into the fall. I have a beautiful retreat. So I just love to also like connect in human form. So I have a retreat that I do in November of each year that that still has some spaces if people want to just connect in, in human form. And those would be the two main things that are that are on the heart consistently. The other programs that we talked about are all online self-taught programs. And then if people want to mentor one-on-one, -on -one, that's always an option that's available. So that's a very personalized program where we hang out for 12 sessions. It can be over 12 weeks or over 24. It's up to you. Um, and then we just go where your desire is taking you and we just allow the unfolding to happen in the way that it's meant to. Okay. Wonderful. And yeah. where can people go to find the programs, the classes, the retreat and more info about you? Yeah, it's all on my website. So my name is heatherivany.com. So I-V-A-N-Y.com. Um, all of my information is on there. I'm on Instagram as well, but it's not it's not so much my heartbeat, but it, there is stuff on there as well. So it's just my name, Heather underscore Ivany. But uh, there's lots of free opportunities on my website as well. There's um, a media tab and there's a free course that you can sign up for. So there's there's different places that you can play and resonate without having to commit if you're not ready to. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. I will be sure to include a link to your website in the show notes in the video description so that people can easily access you. 
Well, Heather, thank you so much again for your time today. I have very much enjoyed the conversation. I imagine that we could have um, an ongoing conversation here about some things. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but time is limited. Time is limited. And I know that uh, we're both pretty busy, but uh, I just wanted to say thank you so much. I really appreciated this opportunity. Well, thanks for having me on your show. And, and I really enjoyed the depth that you're willing to go to today. It, it opened up a lot of meaningful spaces within me to just contemplate on afterwards. So thanks for both the conversation and the afterglow afterwards. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you. And that's a wrap on episode 125 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you're a part of my YouTube audience. Now, you know what's coming up next. All the usual. Sign up for my Patreon. Share this with friends and family, co-workers, and share it on social media, please. Um, follow the podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. You know the grind, but here's the thing. All of that is really important. Putting this podcast together takes quite a bit of time. I spend about 10 hours, sometimes 15 on each episode. Right now, it's a labor of love. I'm in the process of making changes to improve the podcast and the YouTube channel. It's slow going, but your support will help me speed up the process and ensure that I can continue with the podcast and offer much more content than what I do now. As I always like to say, I'm here on the front range doing missionary work in regards to religion, spirituality and ecology, psychedelics and consciousness, and how all of this can help us heal humanity's sacred relationship with the living earth. So if you feel moved by the rebel spirit, and you know, I sure hope that you do, then please, by all means, help me in my efforts to share the good news. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to or watching Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit. <laughs>